I'm John Boyne, and I'm the author of the new novel, The Heart's Invisible Furies. This is a novel which takes place over 70 years of Irish history, from the end of the Second World War in 1945 till the Equal Rights Marriage Referendum in 2015, when Ireland became the first country in the world to vote by public plebiscite for equal rights marriage. The novel is epic in nature because it takes place over such a long period and is narrated by a man called Cyril Avery. Cyril is uh, adopted at birth by a rather eccentric Dublin couple and over the years he starts to, firstly as a teenager he realizes he's gay uh, but this is at a time in Ireland when homosexuality is still illegal. He forms many friendships and many romances through this time, but ultimately is forced to leave Ireland to discover who he really is and to feel that he can fit in to society in some way. It begins with a young woman named Catherine Goggin, 16 years old, who is pregnant and unmarried in a small West Cork town in the south of Ireland. Catherine is exiled from the parish by the parish priest uh, for this terrible crime and she travels to Dublin on her own to begin a new independent life, which is where she gives birth to Cyril, and she and he then have very separate lives, even though they uh, pass each other's way on many occasions. Although there's a lot of drama in the novel, it's also a novel which is full of humour. Uh, we've seen Cyril get into quite a lot of scrapes along the way, uh, some of which are of his own making and some of which aren't. Um, I hope you enjoy the novel. Um, this is a, a scene from the first chapter of the novel, The Good People of Goleen. Long before we discovered that he had fathered two children by two different women, one in Drimma League and one in Clonakilty, Father James Monroe stood on the altar of the Church of Our Lady, Star of the Sea, in the parish of Goleen, West Cork, and denounced my mother as a whore. The family was seated together in the second pew, my grandfather on the aisle using his handkerchief to polish the bronze plaque engraved to the memory of his parents that was nailed to the back of the woodwork before him. He wore his Sunday suit, pressed the night before by my grandmother, who twisted her jasper rosary beads around her crooked fingers and moved her lips silently until he placed his hand atop hers and ordered her to be still. My six uncles, their dark hair glistening with rose-scented lacquer, sat next to her in ascending order of age and stupidity. Each was an inch shorter than the next, and the disparity showed from behind. The boys did their best to stay awake that morning. There had been a dance the night before in Skull, and they'd come home mouldy with the drink, sleeping only a few hours before being roused by their father for mass. At the end of the row, Beneath a wooden carving of the tenth station of the cross sat my mother, her stomach fluttering in terror at what was to come. She hardly dared to look up. Mm.